Dr. Bear. <laughs> Who's up here now? Team Manual for the publication. Now let's start out with two the big four. Congrats, Dr. Bear. Um, at Grain, um, after the graduate student Q and A around two forty-five ish, they can join us there. Um, and we didn't have any diversity here, so this is a chance to share events, papers, research, things that help us increase our understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Anything from me? <laughs> from Casey actually sent this on over to me. Um, the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources DEI Committee is hosting um, a presentation by Carol Hall. Um, it's titled Sovereignty and Race, Intersections of Nantucket and Lenape Identities. Um, that is on Tuesday, April 4th. And I just wanted to read a brief description of that talk. Um, I think it'll help us understand some DEI issues right in our own area and in our state with indigenous communities. It says, my presentation explores how racial identities and categories particularly impact the Nantucket and Lenape people in Delaware and New Jersey. Their ongoing efforts to maintain and assert tribal sovereignty are, are continuously intersected with the politics of race and ever shifting racial categories. So with this read on April 4th, I would highly recommend um, that lecture. I believe there's a section for Colonial as well. So thank you, Casey, for sharing this. The DOE, the ICF committee, this isn't for a while, but they're advertising it today and they had a couple workshops on civic and inclusive Yes, I think that email was yeah, in May, right? So keep an eye out, that's in May, May 5th, right? So please keep an eye out, highly recommend attending that seminar um, about inclusion and inclusive field practices. Many of us will head to the field right in the summer or have already gone to the field to prepare for the field. So that would be really <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Chris Williamson, for being with us today. I know many of you have had a, had a chance to interact um, with Chris today. Um, Chris McDonald has been meetings, etc. Um, Dr. Chris Williamson received his PhD in planning and policy analysis from the University of Southern California. And he's going to present very different cases in planning from the state of California, different than we see here in Delaware. Um, he went on to work there as faculty in the School of Policy, Planning, and Development in the Department of Geography there. He has expertise and experience in housing, land use, environmental policy, and planning. He's also a Fulbright Fellow in Berlin and D.C. He's a certified planner um, and has worked in that capacity in multiple communities, including now serving on the New York Planning Commission. So, lots of questions you can ask about research as well as about what's happening right here in Boston with the campuses and work. So, please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Bear with me as I hook up technology here. <laughs> Gotta get hooked up. Let's see, so I, I do that, I'm good. Becca, can you get rid of that? Uh, Not that one. Oh, Just the control rod, hit that on there, got it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm used to having a, a big screen behind me. So this, forgive me, I'm gonna be looking over here to see where I am and Make sure I'm not talking too much off topic. I'll need to drink water. I hope I don't have to clear my throat. I really apologize. I hate that, <clears throat> but I have to do it. Becca, would it be possible to share screen so that we can also see the slides? Yeah. Okay. How's that work? I'm going to go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for calling me that. I'm going to go talk to the tech people. All right, so I shall try to entertain you for half an hour or so <clears throat> and share what I, my little journey, right, in life, uh, professional and, and academic and so forth. And I hope it will <clears throat> in, in, enlighten you to some extent, at least make you aware of some things going on on the West Coast, which have a tendency to trickle across the country and come back East, uh, in, in, at least in the planning profession. Uh, as you know, all the loose nuts roll to California, and then it becomes embedded in California, and the stuff comes back east, and suddenly everybody has to do stuff in California. 
screwed up or whatever. But uh, let me continue. Let's not. Uh oh, so my topic, my title here from smart. <clears throat> when you've been around a while, <laughs> you, you realize that uh, in the planning world and maybe in academics, you know, you go through these phases of the fad term and the fad. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, the, the, um, uh, the paradigm of the moment. And in the 90s, it was smart growth. We're going to be smart, but it's still growth, right? And then we got into adaptation with climate change, adaptive growth. We're now in sustainable growth, uh, resilient. That's another term, right? I think that's the newest one. <laughs> and I'm suggesting uh, in my title here, are we avoiding an inconvenient truth? I picked up on that one, of course, from Al Gore and inconvenient truth. And maybe we should be talking about degrowth. Not that's a bad term. I don't like it, but it's all I could come up with. All right. And it's just me. By, you know, so let me, uh, my topics are, I got to stand over here so I can read them. So I'll, you know, why did I pick this topic? I want to share with you the report of the Commission on Population and the American Future from 1972. I have it right here. This is my prop. <laughs> this is not the whole report. It's a stack this big. And it was typed before computers. Remember, <laughs> there was an age when there were not computers. Uh, this is just a synopsis of the major findings. I'll share that with you. That leads me to my question here is planning the planning profession and the thinking about America's future and the world for that matter, locked in the <laughs> perpetual growth paradigm, perpetual growth. All we ever want is more growth, more growth, more growth. Climate change comes along and meets perpetual growth, all right? Boom, in some places. Really bad things are gonna happen because a lot of people are in the wrong places with terms of climate change, you're aware of that. And people are, are already moving away from that. And then I'll end up with the degrowth question. And the dog on the right is my dog. So her name is Sulu. How many recognize the word Sulu? I see one, two Star Trek fans. Okay, yes. She's named after Ensign Sulu. All right. So again, this is just quickly, you can read this for, about myself. I didn't. Uh, I went to high school in Maryland, and I remember in 10th grade, uh, I, I walk in at the beginning of the year, and the 10th grade biology teacher, I can picture her, she comes out and she says, this is new curriculum from the state of Maryland, <coughs> brand new book called environmental stuff. Here's a, here's a new word, biomass. Here's a new word, ecosystem, was all brand new. We're talking, I was there at the birth of the environmental movement uh, in high school. That got me interested in, in that. Uh, went to Penn State, BS Geography, Landscape Architecture, Masters and so forth. Uh, worked for the Census Bureau down in uh, Maryland, uh, outside Washington, where they do hire geographers. There is hope for geographers. <laughs> uh, started teaching, went out to grad school uh, to USC, partly for fun. I hate to admit, you know, I'm not going to be shy. And L.A. in the 1980s, when you, if you were uh, had a little money, it was fun, man. It was <laughs> it was hard to go to grad school some days. And and I admit I was not the most serious academic uh, out there, and none of them were really. Um, and ended up out in uh, Ventura County. Where's my Ventura person who's got a T-shirt with Ventura written on it? Oh, she's not here. Okay, one of your one of your student one of your colleagues has a sweatshirt with Ventura, and she's I don't know where it is. Okay, I'll I'll tell you. Um, uh, yeah, I, I had this chance to go on a Fulbright uh, with demography, and I'll, I'll just for, as a quick aside, you know, we have this international group here in this room, which is really interesting. Uh, I'm in Germany, <clears throat> and this was 20 years ago, but. Uh, we're in the, talking to members of the German Bundestag, the parliament, the, the Congress of Germany. And one of them, and they have translators and all, it was really neat. 
And he goes, he says, you know, you Americans, you don't realize that in Europe, our nations are large extended tribe tribes. We're all related to each other. We don't have a history of immigration. And in Germany, the immigration problem, quote unquote, was Turkey, Turkey, Turks in Germany and, and that sort of stuff. And that was one of the topics. But uh, anyway, um, it's, it's when you from you from California and to here with a, a, an international student body, to me, that's like being home. You know, it's like normal. Um, I don't know why I brought that up, but anyway, uh, demography is one of my interests as well. Uh, and then I did a lot of other stuff, but um, I spent 20 years as the principal planner. <clears throat> that means you're the, the, the highest person in the little bureaucracy, technical wise. Uh, the planning director who has the nice title is the person who has to go and sit in front of a city council and explain why this building got built or something didn't happen and they, they're mad at him or her. And, and that's the job you don't want. <laughs> Being the principal planner is like, you're the expert for the city in everything. What, and, and you'd go into a meeting and, and you go like, what is it? What's this meeting about? Well, the state government just passed an, a, a statute requiring all cities to, um, oh, uh, uh, manage their aquifers. There's people here with water, water interests. <clears throat> Stop overdrafting the aquifers. Come up with a groundwater management plan that reaches sustainable groundwater in 20 years. How do we do that? We have to gradually reduce our water pumping for the city's water. Where are we going to get our water? I don't know. We're going to have to figure that out. But the state says you can't stick straws in the ground and just pump forever, right? You know that. And finally, the law changed. Now we got to deal with it. Call Chris. <laughs> okay, so uh, 40 years in California was enough. Uh, I'm retiring, half retiring back here. I picked Delaware on purpose for tax reasons and others. Grew up in the area, just know it well. And... Um, Happy to have this opportunity to both vent some of my academic and professional frustrations, uh, but also maybe have a role in, in helping out here uh, with you all as well. All right. Okay, so let me take you back just 20 years. And this is, I know I'm, I'm old. Uh, I, this must be a mistake. I can't be that old. So Ventura County is an interesting county. There's a map of it there on your screen. Uh, it's northwest of Los Angeles County. And the next county up is Santa Barbara, all right? So this is the Gold Coast of California, very high uh, property values. Um, just north of here is where Oprah lives, okay, yep. in Montecito, and that kind of multi-million dollar homes. Um, <clears throat> in the 1960s, the East County, you can see on the map, there's sort of a lot of gray. Those are incorporated cities, uh, the city of Thousand Oaks, things like that. A lot of movie people live in uh, west Eastern Ventura County, just west of Los Angeles. Rolling Hills, pretty country, although it, during a drought, it gets pretty dry and we have wildfires. But um, in the 1960s, if you, can go back that far, Los Angeles was progressively moving towards our county, okay? More and more subdivisions. The, the San Fernando Valley was filling up with subdivisions. And the people who lived in Ventura County, many of whom were descendants of a lot of the first Anglo uh, families, <laughs> certainly there were Native Americans already there, but the Anglo families that had moved in and more or less taken the land from the Chumash. There had also been a, uh, uh, it was one of the missions of um, Father uh, Juan, I always forget his last name. He, he's the, the 26 missions in California. That's something, I can't remember. Anyway, it was one of the missions of the California missions. So there's this history going back almost three, 200, 300 years. And there's a 
very good agricultural base there. A lot of your strawberries come from the city of Oxnard. Uh, 90 some thousand acres remaining of some of the best agriculture in the world. Really good soil, usually enough water, and year round, the temperature allows three crops a year, constant irrigation, constant uh, agriculture. So they said, we will not become Los Angeles, we will not become Orange County and just get paved over with suburbs and mini malls and whatever and freeways. So they adopted what they called in 1967 um, Greenbelt Agreements. Those are what, let me see, I'll show you those in a minute. Uh, they, this prevented the cities from growing into each other. So it's a spatial policy. We will not allow our cities to essentially just grow right into each other. And you don't even know when you go from one to the other. Okay, that's a green belt. Preserve the ag, preserve the open space. 1969, the aptly named guidelines for orderly development called the God memo, as if God, him or herself, or I don't know what the right gender things I'm supposed to say. <laughs> God themselves uh, uh, issued this memo. Uh, but the God memo was issued and the, the city signed on, all 11 cities. And then in 1995, even with these policies and regulations, cities were still annexing and, and building outwards, the cities in Ventura County. So the, the voters got mad and they voted through an initiative process that only the voters could approve outward expansion of the cities. They took that power away from their elected officials and reserved it to themselves. So the people essentially said, we do not wanna grow out. We really don't wanna grow at all. We're happy with our county, just like it is. And we don't trust you, the council members, to make decisions for us anymore. We are gonna take back that power. And it's been upheld in all the courts. And that's called SOAR, Save Our Open Space. Um, any development in the ag and open space areas requires voter approval. And the really big decisions then are based on the voters make them. Okay, that took too long. Okay, here's the green belt map. No urban development in the green belts. You can see the green belts on your map there. This is the prime agricultural land, some of the best in the world. Also, one third of the county's economy is agriculture. And they wanna keep it that way. SOAR requires voter approval. SOAR started in Napa and Sonoma counties. If you know California, that's wine country. To keep those counties in wine production upheld in the courts. Any development that occurs is within the city limits. Basically you have to go up, not out. Now that's not bad, right? And so development does, does continue, but it's now going into multifamily and uh, taller buildings and infill. So this was in planning terms, this is like a, an experiment. Can a community take control of its urban development pattern, geographic pattern, as well as the political process? Can a community sustain its economy without constantly building new and new and new and instead build up? And the answer, I, I remember when this was passed, the real estate industry went bananas. They sued and then they said, oh my God, you know, the whole county, the economy is gonna fail. There'll be massive unemployment, just on and on and on. And we, it didn't happen. All right. So what did, after working for this city for 20 years, what did, here's my little, my pithy, uh, insights to things, all right? First of all, let's talk about planning theories. The rational model. If you ever go to planning school, Becca, you've been there, right? Anybody else taking a planning course? Couple. The rational model is you develop this vision for what your community wants to look like, all right? And then you, you adopt a general plan and the general plan has a geographic maps and things. And you say family, single family and commercial and industrial. And here's our parks. And then you develop regulations. So that's what you get. And you require permits. And you only issue permits that implement the plan. And therefore, we can 
actually produce this vision we promised you. And you work with the public to develop the vision. That's the rational model. And that's what we all sort of assume is happening uh, when you have planning in, in at least the planning states in the country. Most, that's the California, Massachusetts, Maryland, Pennsylvania, most states have some kind of planning. Some states it's very loose, like Texas maybe. In other states it's very regulated, like California. All right, and then obviously in some of your countries where you're from, uh, you may have different levels of planning, right? National planning and so forth. All right, number two, the other theory is protect property values. Whatever you do in issuing permits in my city, don't reduce my property value. I'm a homeowner and I vote. And that was uh, the book on the right there called The Zoning Game from 1966. Was, was a classic in planning schools. So it's a fun little read about how decisions are made really to protect home values, all right? If you own a home, or you will someday, <laughs> you'll have a better appreciation of that. You may not agree with it, but at least you appreciate it. All right, number three, implement state laws. This, cities and counties in California are creatures of state government, not federal, but state. And whatever the state tells you to do, you more or less have to do. So planning, implement state laws. Follow the grant money. The state will pass out money. Say, we want you to build a reservoir. And here's the money. Well, okay, we'll do it. Give us the money. Do as directed by your elected officials. Basically, I've, I've sat in many meetings where, you know, where there, the staff is there like, well, what do we do with this project? And the answer is, what does the city manager want us to do? Go talk to the city manager. What does the city council want me to do? I answer to the city council. It's the council that matters. And finally, and this is why the key to this thing is accommodate growth, right? Accommodate market-driven growth in your area. If there is high demand, get the units built, that kind of thing. All right, we'll come back to that. Now, here's my five corollaries. <clears throat> Seldom do planners question accommodating growth. They see that as the norm. They see that as your purpose. You're supposed to accommodate growth. I'll come back to that. Well, the next one, projection-based, population projection-based planning is a self-fulfilling circular argument. All right, so let me, you do population projections 20 years or 30 years into the future, right? And it says, just like right here is the, the plan for Newark City. And in here on page uh, 25, they're talking about the population of the city in the year 2040 should be 40,000. That's more than today. Therefore, we should plan to have more housing, right? Therefore, we relax the regulations to allow more housing. The housing gets built, people show up. Oh, the projections were right. Therefore, this is a good way to do planning because there's like this assumption that if, if the population projection says these people are coming, they're coming no matter with or with houses, they're gonna come. And that's, that's just not true, but um, that's, when you revisit your plan 20 years later and you look back and you say, oh, that population did happen, then that justifies that method, right? They, this method of planning must be correct, it worked. We got 20,000 more people or whatever in 20 years. So population-based planning is self-fulfilling. Accommodating the market will eventually ruin your community. Ouch, that hurts. If it's a desirable community. So <laughs> you, you go through this vision process with your public, your, your residents. You say, tell me what kind of community you want, right? And I asked Becca and I asked others, well, we want a nice downtown. We want a hospital. We want parks. Great. And we, we build that for you. 
over time. And it's a nice community. And you all know what nice communities there are. So people, other people want to live there, right? Sure. And if you build more housing, they will come. They'll, they'll move in. And then 10 years later, because your pop projection said, well, we have a trend of increasing population, therefore we have to keep building housing. Okay, you build some more. You got more people, you got more people. And you end up with Ocean City, New Jersey, uh, Maryland. You've been to Ocean City, Maryland, anybody? I don't like it, maybe you do. It's a bunch of high rises on the beach. Compare that with say Rehoboth Beach, you know, which is the nicer town, okay? You get my drift. The market could ruin the very nice things you're trying that attract people there in the first place. Okay, uh, this supply side approach to housing uh, cannot permanently lower costs because in a nice area, the more the lower the cost it gets, more people want to move there. It's it's a self fulfilling demand. And finally. The population projection methodology, how much time am I? Am I talking too long? I only have that. <laughs> I'll promise I'm going to go faster. Um, the projections have buried some very important assumptions. Now, I, I, I assume all of you have some appreciation of population projections. You have to make assumptions about birth rates, death rates, migration, and so forth. Uh, Buried in there are all kinds of assumptions like, well, we'll always have enough water, we'll always have enough uh, utilities, climate change will not be, we can, we can figure that out, we'll get by, so forth. So um, there's a bunch of stuff in there that any of those could be debated. I'm going to move, I got to move quicker. All right, the report on the Commission on Population in the American Future. Real quick, the American post-war, we had a baby boom, you know, all, I'm, I'm a product of the baby boom, a few of you are in here. Um, there were there was a big fear of continued high birth rates. Uh, these are some of the books that were published in the late 60s and early 70s. In 1969, President Nixon established this commission. That's the name of it. Um, this was before Watergate and before Roe v. Wade. All right. And for two years, the demographic and geographers and all the experts in the country got together. And they did a thorough study on how important is it to have continuous population growth to the American future. You can read that later. Here's the cover letter. And this is the, a, a small version of the report right here. And I always thought this phrase here, and I'll read it to you. We have concluded in the long run, no substantial benefits will result, result from future growth. Stabilization of our population would contribute to the nation's ability to solve its problems. We have looked for and have not found any convincing economic argument for continued growth. That's radical stuff. That is un-American. I mean, you would be, you know, 50 spears in your view if you're a politician and set up and got up and said, we don't need economic growth, right? Or population growth. You can have economic growth without population growth, right? But we've always associated the two together. All right, the health of the country does not depend on it, nor does the vitality of business or the welfare of the average person signed by John Nelson Rockefeller, um, who later became vice president. And this was the best experts of the day. And as far as I can tell, the only time the American government has actually done a national study on demography and projection. And the conclusion was we don't have to grow. All right, um, you can read the report, you can Google it online. And it's included many other things with geographic aspects, like there's not enough water in the Southwest. You're gonna have wildfires in the Southwest and other problems that were just obvious back then, 50 years ago. Uh, what has happened, the, the population continued to grow the US government, I mean, the United States uh, gained 75% more people since 1960. The, uh, the West, 13 states almost doubled in population. You know, nobody paid attention to this report. 
the story is that between Watergate, where Nixon got had to resign, which gobbled up all the airtime, and the Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion, this issue kind of went away. And the birth rate did fall substantially after the baby boom. So the kind of the whole problem kind of maybe went away uh, for the, but we still have tremendous growth. California uh, went from 16 million to 40 million in places that probably shouldn't grow that much. Okay, uh, the, you can read this later. The growth in the country is largely through immigration. And most people don't realize that the United States government legally enters almost 2 million people a year. That's almost 1% of the population every year, every year. Were it not for immigration, legal, and then there's also undocumented, um, the US population wouldn't be near what it is now. All right, so I, I put that in there, not to make a value statement either way, but to point out that it's, it's a policy of the United States government to, to grow the population, growth. So this is a pro-growth uh, policy and pro-economic, you know, and you've heard all those reasons. Um, moving on, how does that translate down to local governments? So you can read this list, but I want to um, drop down to number seven and get back to this topic of planning again, how what I call vision-based planning, where I give you a community that you want versus projection-based planning, where somebody does population projections, like here at the University of Delaware or other universities and state governments, it shows this future increase largely driven by national, some national policies, and we have to plan for that future population. This never ends. It just goes up. It just had, there's no end date to that, right? Development is like water. It flows downhill on the path of least resistance. And there's no national policy about where this growth should occur. So the US government is, is, is allowing 2 million people into the country. Okay, that's fine. Where do they go? There's no direction telling, it's, it's market driven, it's economic driven, and a lot of the growth is going to the West and the South, right? Not so much to the Midwest and where's Maine? Does Maine have anybody left in Maine? <laughs> He's the last one, he turned the lights off. <laughs> um, so you have a national pro-growth policy no real direction as to where it should go within the country, except that development and growth in general tends to draw towards areas where it's allowed. You know, like, like Texas. Right now, Texas is booming. Florida is booming. These are the states with the least regulations and the most pro-growth policies. All right. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this. You can Google this one too. Out, and I'm going to switch to California. And what's my time? Uh, oh, okay. So we have this thing in California. Now I'm, now I'm uh, sharing with you the 20 years in California called the Regional Housing Needs Assessment or RENA, R-H-N-A, which starts with a population projection done by the state of California Department of Finance based on past trends, what's the past trend of California's population? Like this. So what's the future? Like that, it's just math, right? So what does the state government tell local governments you gotta do? Accommodate growth in perpetuity, right? Forever, there's no end to this. What if you don't do that? They come and they, they slam you with a whole bunch of state laws. And there, in the last five years, and this is one reason I kind of left the profession, there have been over 300 state laws at the state level 
overriding local government's ability to manage their land use. In other words, if I lost, am I, am I making sense? I, I hope so, okay. In other words, planning for population growth in perpetuity with no end in sight is now forced on communities that would rather do vision-based planning that may not accommodate that much growth because we don't want that much growth, all right? So you see the, the conflict between projection-based growth, which is the normal in the planning profession versus what people like me really see on the ground, which is my residents and my voters saying, we don't want all this growth. We like our community just the way it is. Conflict, conflict. State law comes in through something like this. And these are all the methodologies involved in how we're going to set a number for you. The state government basically says to every jurisdiction in California, here is your target number of housing units. If you don't see, if they don't get built in your community, you're in trouble. In fact, if you're falling behind in actual units, housing units issued, um, we're going to override all your local rules and basically anything can be uh, approved in some ways. And this applies to communities that are in the middle of wildfire zones. These are communities on the beach where sea level rise is mapped and, and you know, threatening the, the coastal housing. So the right hand of the state government saying you must plan for perpetual growth and allow all these housing units. And the same state government, different department, is saying, oh my gosh, you've got to, cl you've got to plan for sea level rise. You've got to uh, plan for sustainable water supplies. And, and they're like, they don't match. <laughs> but the local, peop the local people, the peeps down here, the me's, we see this law and we see this regulation and we're going, oh, we got to somehow work this out. You're the principal planner, figure it out. <sighs> yeah, right. Okay, so you can read those later. Um, this is more of the same. Okay, so cities are now fighting back in California. The city of Huntington Beach, a really nice city near the beach, dense. This is a dense city uh, with, with a multiple uh, multifamily housing and, and really small lots. You know, you could reach out and touch the neighbor's house if you think you have a single family. The other house is right there. And, but it's the surfing capital of the world and, and so forth. And it's a big tourist attraction. They don't want to add 5,000 housing units or whatever the number is. They're fighting back. All right. And just this morning, or maybe it was yesterday, the state has filed a lawsuit against the city to overturn their lawsuit. You know, the lawsuits are starting. And the residents or city councils all over California are pushing back and trying to stop the state legislature for, from, from taking you know, complete control of local land use. All right. Uh, this list here was just from yesterday. This is the American Planning Association identified bills in the current legislative session of California, all related to housing and basically overriding local control of housing and land use and essentially geography. I put on the right is my restating that accommodating projected growth forced on you by a state legislature uh, versus traditional planning or what I learned in grad school is, you know, you, the vision based planning. And basically the state is saying, you can't have what you want. We're telling you, you got to add more people, more housing and then more people. And this is more related to that. Now on the right side there, disaster planning. One reason I am interested in Delaware is you have this disaster, what's it called? The disaster something? Research Center. Research Center. Anybody here involved in you? Okay. And correct me if my R's are wrong on the right. Um, 
I've lived through numerous disasters in California, right? Wildfires, earthquakes, and so forth. And the city government is the first responders. It's the fire and the police. And then city employees have to go to a emergency operations center. And we have to start pretending we're having a massive disaster. What do we do, right? And we go through exercises, table exercises on massive earthquakes, wildfires, and so forth. And then they, they happen. Um, the usual, the list on the right there is the R list, we call that. Uh, review a potential disaster. Rehearse how you would respond to a potential disaster. If it really happens, first responders are out there, fire and police departments, public works. Rescue people. After, recover their bodies. They didn't make it, all right? Rebuild. Here we go. We just start rebuilding right away. Reimburse everybody for a lot of your losses. Insurance companies, FEMA starts handing out money. The insurance industry finds a way to somehow reinsure everybody. Maybe the federal government backs it all up with reinsurance. And this whole cycle repeats, right? And whether it's a wildfire or a coastal storm that bangs up the coast, which is happening right now in California, there's a massive storm smashing up piers and hitting beachfront houses. And this is gonna happen. It's happening right now. And it happens over and over and over again. But what about relocate and retreat? You know, and, and here's finally my topic. <laughs> And I, what am I at now? I still got 15 minutes. Okay. All right. Really bad things are going to happen, and people are already beginning to move. This is an article I found uh, wildfires that wiped out thousands of homes in California. People aren't moving back. You know, they're leaving the state. I left the state. And this is happening to some extent, you know, everywhere where there's perhaps climate change problems, climate, either real or perceived or expected. This is my little disaster scenario that involves Phoenix, but it could be Las Vegas or it could be any other city in the Southwest. You have a summer heat wave that's really, really hot, 115 or higher. That's very foreseeable in 10, 20 years, if not even now. The electrical system starts failing big time. Transformers blow up, stuff you cannot repair quickly. There's no air conditioning, there's no electricity. The bridge and roads start buckling. The heat has forced the expansion of the metal and the concrete and they bust up like this because it's beyond their design criteria. Where's my civil engineers? There's one, all right. Does that make sense? Yep, shake his head. Emergency vehicles literally sink into the blacktop. The blacktop is melting. The road is melting. You can't get anywhere. Public panics. They start getting in their cars and they start driving out of town. And the roads have buckled or something else has happened in accidents. They start running out of gas. They, people are dying in, in traffic jams. Airports close. The air is so thin, airplanes cannot land. People die. And then what will happen? We'll clean it up and we'll come back and build Phoenix again. So the question is, this perpetual growth rebuild cycle, how do you get out of this for places where we shouldn't be anymore? How do we get out of these really dangerous places? How do we degrow? I called it degrowth. Maybe there's a better term, happy to have it. We do this a little bit in some places. We move towns out of floodplains. We've done that. We try to move some facilities away from the beach. Um, I think the, the ones that are, you find on, on YouTube are the uh, lighthouses that get moved back, you know, little stuff like that. So, but I'm talking big time stuff, entire cities that really shouldn't be in the desert in, in 30 or 40 years from now. Um, this is from the, a study I found IPCC, you know about mitigation and adaptation. And these are all the public infrastructure at risk. 
with climate change. You may have seen something like this before. There, my bottom question on the right is perpetual growth planning. That's what we have based on incremental climate change adaptation. So a lot of you in here are working on climate change adaptation, very important. But is it in the long run putting more people at risk because they're still there in the bad place they shouldn't be? And you can only adapt so much before it just fails and you just got to get out of there. Maybe it's the delta of, of Bangladesh. Maybe it's a, a river delta or a desert. Somewhere where the future environment with climate change is so deadly and so destructive, we, we just got to get out of there entirely. Okay? So I call that degrowth. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, is planning is planning and I and but including geography, the appropriate profession best suited to explore degrowth. How how do we undo in, in the United States 400 years of perpetual growth and the property rights that we've given out to millions of people who own that single family home? Don't don't threaten my home values. Um, if I'm near the beach, it's even more important. How do we deal with that? Can you have a, a stable political system and a stable economic system without population growth, without that constant growth that we, we got used to, right? We're just so used to having more people buying more toothbrushes and the profits for toothbrushes always keep going up because there's always more customers. Right, that's the easy growth. It's just more consumers, and so far the only real way we see significant change is you have really big disasters. Katrina in New Orleans, Super Sandy storm in New York City, and even then, nobody. Some people moved, but the government came in, the insurance industry came in, and they just rebuilt everything back in the same places, and it will again, it will happen again someday. All right, major countries are dealing with declining populations in certain areas, China, East Germany, Italy, Spain, Japan. This is a thing I saw in Japan, ad adaptation to demographic change, population aging, how to plan for declining population on purpose, how to get people out of the danger in the long run something we don't talk about. Finally, I think I'm done here. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, what would this involve? Literature review, of course, um, studies and reports, case studies. There probably are case studies out there. My guess is the track record on this is not really good. Uh, there's not a lot of, not a lot of, I could be wrong. I'm happy to be wrong. Um, but this is not an area that's been seriously explored at a large scale uh, and could become, you know, if I was a lot younger, it could become a nice uh, dissertation topic or something, or research topic. We have case studies here. We have, you know, rust belt cities, flood zones, et cetera. That's usually not a voluntary degrowth, that's triggered by something bad happening, right? And then people didn't come back and the economy went downhill and it's, it's considered a bad thing. The Rust Belt, decline of Rust Belt cities, for example. It, it was degrowth, but it was done in a bad way. Can we do degrowth where we should because of climate change now and in the future? And we, can we do it in a, in a planned way? My last pithy statement is 10 years from now, when something bad happens to Phoenix and people are saying, why did, we, why did Phoenix add 2 million more people when we knew this could happen, right? And, and the answer is, there's no good answer to that, okay.
I'm going to stop there. Oh, don't clap. <laughs> I hope, <laughs> I hope uh, that wasn't, that's kind of like 40 years of pent up frustration, you know, <laughs> and you just, you just heard it all. And I hope you, you, I appreciate your tolerance and I hope it made sense. And uh, I hope it's useful somehow. Okay, we have about five minutes for questions, but I'll monitor the Zoom chat for folks on Zoom. Feel free to put your questions in the chat. We'll start with anyone in the group. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thanks for that in panoramic view of planning from more from California perspective, but I think it's a good idea to put it out there. Uh, in terms of your view of how um, Delaware as a state is um, planning for climate change, I guess you consider it more mm -hmm. of a state of climate change, and now you are also on planning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where do you think we are making the right decisions and where are we uh, falling into the hands of the past, uh, especially the carbon delivery? I'll, I'll try, but I'm not, I, I'm a little bit familiar with Delaware. I think you're one of the first states that got a comprehensive coastal coastal sea level rise adaptation plan for the whole state. I admit I haven't read it, but just being familiar with the middle part, the Kent County coastline being relatively murky <laughs> and, and there's houses out there, right? A uh, couple developments on sandbars. Are, are we gonna rebuild those in perpetuity or should those, there be some way to retire those houses off of that land over time. Um, uh, amortization, for example, you know, after 20 years, your property rights go away. You got to go because the cost of defending that handful of houses out there on a sandbar where the first storm surge is going to knock them all down. Why do we do that? Other than their property rights, I get that. Is there is there discussion in the plan about abandoning property rights along the coast where sea level rise is just going to really take them out anyway? I don't know. Is that no? <laughs> no, we have to be trying to renourish the beaches. Renourish the beaches and and your acceptable, but I also studied relocation, so we have COVID. So okay, I need to require construction. So. When you refer, when you renourish a beach, it's still relatively flat. I mean, you can put dunes in, right? And that gets you some elevation. How how high will those elevations go? So here's here's one. Anybody ever? Where's anybody been to California? I hope. Okay, Newport Beach. You know Newport Beach, wonderful. Right on the coast, high income. You know, really really nice. And Balboa Island is out there really flat and there's a seawall all around the island with multi-million dollar homes all on the island the seawall right now is two feet high it's just behind the sidewalk it's really more of a high tide keep the water off the streets um, the firm i was working with they were looking at raising it to four feet for sea level rise that takes care of the next the next level of coastal erosion. So what do you do after that? Do you raise it to six feet after that? And then the eight, when do you say adaptation doesn't work anymore? Um, and, and how, and what do we do? We nobody's. So I don't know, to answer your question. Yeah, and, and yeah, th there you go. And, and that is, that is one answer. So you could build a, a giant uh, dike around Balboa Beach for the sake of a couple thousand homes. Yeah. Well, let's have that discussion. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. 
like full frontal bear that you see. Yeah. So that much also that if you can see instead of the small I have a planning plot edge structure to see if there are other walls in my park. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing is that uh, I don't know if you have watched and or you are thinking about the population block, but population block has to go high and come in the library and then when it's publicly. And the problem with public is that they are much bigger. So how do you value them? And that's the main problem of in this country are uh, developers and we don't work in developing countries. So mm. how, what's the price of public? So how do you value how to go to school? Yeah, yeah. And uh, if you can up enough fast enough, then that will be much enough down to the opportunity to have in my domain the opportunity of rebuilding the effect of climate change. Yeah. So I don't know if you have been approached to this issue. I, I haven't thought too much about it, to be honest. And that's kind of the, it would, if I had a pile of grant money, it would be an interesting to explore, you know, because you have certain thresholds of where you need certain public goods, right? So I'm I'm just picking some numbers. Let's say for every 100,000 people, you need a full-size hospital, right? And if you drop below 100 and the hospital goes away, that doesn't work for the people still there. So how do you walk down an urban world uh, in a safe way? I don't know. But that's the kind of question that needs looked into. I mean, that would be part of the scope of your research of some kind. Of how do you walk down what we got? How, how do you walk it down? What, what another angle on this, just as an aside, is you know the argument, well, if you don't have enough, if people, you have fewer people, fewer people in the workforce, fewer people paying taxes, you know, that whole argument, who's going to do all the work? And you've already seen that when you go to uh, a fast food store and you know there's they've got help wanted signs everywhere right and uh, one of the proposed answers to that is uh, artificial intelligence and automation and, and I've, I've, I've listened to ted talks and other things that basically say between ai and automation we could get by with a lot fewer people who have different kinds of jobs now assuming that happens and we'd still have economic prosperity and growth, economic growth without population growth due to AI and, and um, automation. And, and the idea is that that's gonna happen anyway. And so isn't it better to end up with fewer people, if you're gonna have AI and automation, have the right number of people instead of a whole bunch of surplus people? <laughs> Who have lost their jobs or whatever because of AI and automation. You know, in other words, one of the findings of this uh, report was there's no social problem in the world, or in the United States at least, that wouldn't be better dealt with if it was smaller and fewer people were, were homeless or fewer people. You know, so anyway, I'll. Thank you. Now, I did a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do want to make sure we stuck around time at 236. That's what you want to exit and make sure that we're going to continue the conversation. Okay, we continue. Um, after the Q&A, then. Are we still on Zoom at the same time? Yes. Okay. Still there, yeah. Is there a question in the chat, Becca? No, that was me saying Thank you. So if you're interested, grad students, 